Welcome to Duck Season Somewhere podcast. This episode is brought to you by the following sponsors. For 365 days a year, it's Duck Season Somewhere at Ramsey Russell's GetDucks.com. The world of duck hunting is way bigger than our backyard. The very best duck hunts in Argentina and Mexico are only the beginning. We specialize exclusively in six continents worth of proven waterfowl hunting adventures. Whether you're looking for a unicorn species or a fun trigger pulling vacation of epic proportion, we've got the right hunt dialed in. Real duck hunts and authentic experiences for serious duck hunters. As a genuine American duck hunter myself, I know the difference. Founded in 2003, GetDucks.com is not just what we do, it's all we do. I've been there personally many times. Our reputation speaks for itself. Anita and I are personally available to assist before, during, and after your trip because you deserve nothing less. Looking for something closer to home? The next great hunt is closer than you think. Contact proven operators throughout the U.S. and Canada at our U.S. hunt list. Explore worldwide duck hunting at GetDucks.com. All package details, photos, videos, stories, and thousands of client testimonials right there at your fingertips. GetDucks.com. Ball Shot Shell's copper-plated bismuth tin alloy is the good old days again. Steel shots come a long way in the past 30 years, but will never, ever be like good old-fashioned lead. No way. Say goodbye to all the gimmicky, high-recoil compensation science and marketing hype, and hello to superior performance. Know your pattern. Take ethical shots. Make clean kills. That is the boss way. The good old days are now. It really is duck season somewhere for 365 days per year. Duck season somewhere takes me year-round to worldwide destinations where I visit with the most interesting people. I'm your host, Ramsey Russell. Join me here to listen to those conversations. Guys, welcome back to another episode of Duck Season Somewhere. We're still in COVID mode. Uh, the whole world, every single person I know on Earth is sitting at home. It's like it's like life has just pushed a big old pause button. Pause. Everybody's just standing in place, waiting on the world to start spinning again. Uh, every boundary I've ever crossed, every international boundary is, is sealed up tight. Nobody's coming or going. But I've got a great guest tonight. I know a lot of y'all know Dan Frusco with HP Outdoors. Uh, Dan, how are you tonight? Nothing too bad. How are you doing? Well as to be expected. You know, well as to be expected. There's always a silver lining. And uh, I'm looking for silver linings with this big pause button. But, hey, uh, it's a curveball of effort proportion, you know. And, yeah, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot going on. And uh, I don't – it's hard to to put the TV on and listen to what's going on some of the time. If you don't know what's going on, then you look out, you know, in your perspective area and, and what's going on there versus the rest of the world and what to believe and what not to believe. And it's uh, It's a really, really weird time. The truth is somewhere between <laughs> what you see on television and what you see looking at your front door. That's all I know. Right. We're in the information age. Information has never been so available, so much of it, to be so hidden. Right. I, I, I don't believe anybody I see on, on TV, except I, I do believe most of Donald Trump's tweets. Uh, <laughs> short of that, I don't, I don't believe what these uh, talking heads on TV always say. I'm always suspect of it. Right. Well, I think, you know, like, like all news, they're trying to get everything out first. And uh, it just seems like nobody really knows. You know, they're coming out with new information from Los Angeles right now that possibly 450,000 people might already have it. And, you know, the, the death rate is lower than the actual flu. So if that's the case, then we did all this for a lot of nothing. But then if that's not true, then, you know, we we should be doing what we're doing and save lives, I guess. From where we were last month, it seems like it, it's very infectious, but the mortality is much lower than they had predicted. Right. And uh, but but I, I still get this sense that they are not telling us everything they know. They're just telling us what we need to know. Yeah. But I don't think I don't think they're telling us everything they know. Yeah. You know. I think that the part that gets you too is when you you see something on Facebook that someone wrote 
overseas and, you know, they, you know, they're working 18, 19 hour days and sleeping for four hours. And, you know, there's no rooms in the, in the hospitals and just everyone's dying. And then, you know, you look in my county right here, I think we're up to 15 positive cases out of 82,000 people in the county. And it's just crazy. It is, it's, you don't know what to believe and how, uh, how safe you need to be. Or how they're counting or who they're counting as being COVID or anything like that. I, I, I am reading a book, The Great Influenza. It's, it's a great read, but a slow read. And you know, these, these pandemics, these, uh, you know, the, the Great Influenza of 1918, it literally was just the flu. Yeah. But, but it was, it was, uh, the super flu. And, and, uh, the mortality rate was just unbelievable. And, you know, all this sheltered in place, uh, stuff and, and not, gathering in crowds and everything it really comes to pass like i was reading about a a big parade up in philadelphia uh that year and it wasn't the initial bounce the initial bounce caught some people it man it interrupted world war one in fact uh maybe it even changed the course of world war one when when the germans got it they were on a, a major offensive at the time but the, the bounce uh is, is what really started running through the population but they had this massive parade in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and they 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 were told maybe you ought to cancel it, but they didn't. Right. And uh and golly, it's something like forty five hundred people died in the next twenty four or forty eight hours. Yeah. You know, the the morgue could hold forty people and they had over two hundred stacked up like cordwood in the house. Yeah. It it was it was insane, you know, and and I don't know if uh maybe you know, I just know enough hearing about it to uh, in passing, you know, you, you, uh, different the first version of SARS or uh, uh, swine flu or some of this different stuff that's gone around, bird flu, you know, you hear about this stuff. And, and I'm just aware that, you know, center disease control and those kinds of folks are uh, on guard for a major pandemic that could be as aggressive and fatal and long term as uh, the pandemic of 1918. Yeah, and I don't know what was the what was the parade for because I know uh, St. Louis was supposed to have a big one too, and they ended up canceling it, and they had no bump like Philadelphia had. So I'm not I'm not sure when the actual date was or what the parade was for, but it, from what I understand and, and what I've learned so far reading this book, it, it originated they think in uh, Haskell County, Kansas. An uh, old co country horse doctor uh, had some had some bad flu cases, and uh, and then it just kind of died off. Well, meantime, you had major military bases assembling uh, soldiers to mobilize over to Europe for World War One, mm-hmm. and that 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 became the the, the vector. The, the, mm-hmm. the, the soldiers distributing and moving around the country is how how it spread so quickly. But once it spread, I mean, once it was, once you came in contact, it was all she wrote. I mean, it, it, and, and what was so crazy, it it was affecting uh, young and old, but especially uh, the the young, the, the middle-aged and the healthiest who it was mostly affecting it seemed to. And it was crazy. It was just nuts. And yeah. uh, it was a bad time. You know, with all this stuff and all this news and all this fear mongering going on TV, it's a terrible time to read an interesting book like this. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah. it starts getting in your head, you know, especially when you're dumb redneck like me, you know, just enough to, to really not know much, you know, about well, that's, about you know one, one of the things I thought too, you know, China they said what November December is when the first one originated, and and it's such a global world now. And I told my wife like we were sick for four to six weeks, like nonstop going back and forth, and just couldn't kick it. Antibiotics all over the place, still couldn't kick it. And I told her, I was like, you know, looking back, I went through uh, through Chicago Airport around Christmas time, and she's like, well, it wasn't here then. I was like, well, if it was in China in December and it's that bad, if it transmits that easy, very easily it could have went through, you know, uh, an airport in Chicago. You know, so who knows? But I don't know. We're not we're not seeing it quite as hard as. As other areas. Thank, thankfully, you know, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm thankful. Of course, I live four hours north of New Orleans, and they, they got it bad. They got it yep. real bad. Yep. And uh, I guarantee you there's a bunch of folks from Rankin County, Mississippi, that were down at Mardi Gras. 
mm-hmm. you know, and, and could have, so who knows, you know, who knows. How, I, I was over in uh, Azerbaijan. We were hunting two miles from Iran and uh, at times, and on our way home is when uh, they got sealed off. And, and I really can't remember hearing much or thinking much about this until then. And even then, my wife and I kind of kidded about it. She's like, hey, you know, take precautions on the plane. And, you know, you're in a foreign country, you know. And, um, and so I did kind of find myself at the airport in Istanbul kind of skirting away from folks, mm-hmm. you know. And there were a lot of folks wearing masks already. Yep. And uh and, and, and I do remember when we landed two two weeks preceding that, when I landed in Azerbaijan, you go through immigration, passport control, and then to go down to baggage, uh, there's a big escalator and they were they were sitting there and you had to stop and they were scanning you. Mm. And uh, you know, so okay, well I didn't think much about that. And uh but coming back I was a little you know, I washed my hands a lot, I'll tell you that. And yep. uh <laughs> and, and came home. And and then uh, really, we went to the uh, the Eagles concert, and that was boy, was I glad I went and did that. There, at Maverick Stadium sold out house uh, in Dallas, and and we were all kidding about it. a bunch of old guys like me. We were all kidding about it. And uh, hey, don't be coughing over this way. Well, never mind. You've had enough vodka, it probably killed all those germs. <laughs> and uh, but you, you know, uh, but still, wow, how it's changed since then. You know, yeah. and and even though it it wasn't as deadly and as bad and far reaching um, as they led us to believe it could be, some of the some of the sensationalized media, it's still it's still a pretty bad deal. 184 countries sheltered in place, and yeah. and I, and a lot of countries we go to, Dan, like Argentina, um, we don't know, we don't know yeah. when they're going to open back up. You right. know, I I have seen proposals uh, that are not yet official. But I have seen proposals that uh, airports are going to open in March of 2021. You know, they, that's a that's a very nice and progressive and beautiful country. But but you take the city of Buenos Aires, it, it's the closest thing to New York City I've ever been to. You know, it's a lot of humanity in a, in a short of 14 million people mm. in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a relatively small area, kind of like New York City. And uh, and somebody told me one of the one of the ladies we worked with down there told me a few weeks ago they've got three or four hundred ventilators for fourteen million people. So of course they're worried if that thing were to hit, what would yeah. they do? You know, I don't know. It, it's uh, I don't know. It's just it's just take it by day. And on the bright side, Dan, you've got children. You got small children, don't you? I do. Yep. I got uh, twin girls that are six, and my boy's going to turn five here in May. So. Yeah, are you are you are you spending your days doing lesson plans and homeschooling? <laughs> well, I guess the good thing is I don't have to do the lesson plans, but uh, I have to do the teaching. So, um, you know, everything's online and we go through, and it's it's kind of tough because you know the girls are in kindergarten and they have quite a bit to do for being in kindergarten, and you know the genius mother and and myself going into kindergarten, we're like you know we want them to be in separate classes and kind of, you know, build their own little friends and, you know, figure out who they are. And then maybe later we'll bring them in the same class. Well, now we, <laughs> we got twice the work to do. And, uh, so I'm sitting here with those two and then, you know, still trying to teach my boy stuff and, and, uh, you know, still getting outside and being dad and having fun and, and the rest of it. So it's, uh, definitely life changing. My wife's a physical therapist and, uh, you know, no, she works at the hospital here. There's no visitors allowed. She gets, when she walks into a room, she gets uh, her temperature scanned. When she walks out, she gets it scanned. And when she wow. goes in the building and out of the building, she gets scanned. I, I she's guess not the, not the actual floor when she's on the, when she goes on or not the rooms, but the actual floor, when she comes onto the floor and leaves the floor, they take her temperature. So, so she's essential. She's working. She's working. Dad's at home taking care of the children. It's a, Roller and I'm still from uh, the 1918s, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I know I know a lot of dads like that, you know, and and it's like uh, I kind of wish I kind of wish my children were young, like you know, I, I said it a million times, T I M E, mm. and, and it's like I think I think to my personal life right now, and to my personal life the last ten or go back twenty years, you know, just uh, work, 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 
and I, and I wish, you know, I wish I'd had time. I mean, you know, in a lot of ways, it's a big opportunity right now. Just, just different. But we're, we're all so, man, we, we are all so busy when, when the world is spinning. We're all right. just so busy. You know, I have discovered and found things uh, in my office and in my closet and in my, my garage and in my tool shed, so to speak, that were just forgotten about for a decade. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it could be a little bit of opportunity. I, I asked a friend the other day, so now I'm asking you, are, are, are the less are the, uh, is the schoolwork and the lessons, is it like mandatory? Do you have to turn it in? Or is it kind of a pass fail scenario? As long as, as long as you certify something, do they get to go to the next grade? I'm not, I'm not sure about older grades, like kindergarten. Um, the teachers pretty have, pretty much have the assessment already, but, um, I know this coming Monday, they're going to start, uh, actual new, learning new material. So we'll, I'll actually be teaching material rather than enrichment and review of what they've been going over. So it's going to be a little yeah. bit different, but um, it's kind of a pass-fail situation is what I've heard, in, at least in our state. That's, that's what I think it is. I told you, I got a, a good buddy of mine that's uh, kind of seven and a nine-year-old that are both just tall boys and ran bucks. His, 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 uh, his patience is about like mine, it's about as, you know, if you tore a firecracker fuse off in half, tore it in half, it'll be about that short. <laughs> and uh, so I told him, I said, man, they're going to pass the kid, just sign whatever he needs, take, take them and teach them how to tie flies or paint decoys or change the oil in your truck. Yep. That's, what kid, that's what kids don't get to learn anymore in school. Teach, teach them some valuable stuff right now. Take this opportunity since y'all are all at home and teach them how to crank the mower. Well, I tell you what, that's, uh, <laughs> that's exactly, so, you know, just some stuff they don't learn or not allowed to be taught, is, you know, as far as re- taking personal responsibility, is I'm just hammering that home. And um, another thing that the kids just don't get taught is just anything about finances, right? So oh, man. Uh, we are, every day we're, we're talking about it. I'm making them, you know, <laughs> I got chores going on and they help out a quarter here, a quarter there, a dollar. And, you know, I'm, I'm changing dollar bills for quarters and dimes and, you know, making sure that they understand everything and just showing them how, how money doesn't grow on trees. Right. And how they want to not just spend it every second they, that they get on, on different toys and why we get upset when their toys are out because of how much they cost. And, and just in the last week that I've really been getting into it, it it's been, you know, they're, the wheels are spinning a lot more than what they have in the past. So that's a, that's one good thing about this, the at home situation currently. That, that, boy, I tell you what, you just, you just, uh, you just got a good solid lick on something right now because, you know, especially, especially with all the talk going on, on TV with this COVID and the economy and, and the stick of the spokes, you know, my grandparents, uh, and I'm not that darn old, but I am, I guess I am getting a little long in the tooth, but my grandparents, they went through the depression, mm-hmm. the real deal. Right. My in-laws went through the depression, the, the big one. And they all preached, you know, say for a rainy day, say for a rainy day. And it's becoming a, a lost art on everybody. You know, it, 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 it's, uh, you know, and, and I, I told my old son the other day, he graduates Mississippi State. Graduates Mississippi State in December. Uh, Going to start a business, he and a buddy, and 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 I told him, I said, look, man, you're 22 years old. Uh, you are you're just at that phase of life where this economy stuff right now really doesn't affect you. So him and his buddies, uh, next week, jump in a truck. They're going to do a four or five state turkey tour. They've, they've done it every year since right before they, they 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 got back just in the nick of time to graduate high school. Uh, but they went on that dead week before graduation and did a turkey tour. And they, they, that's something they do every year. But I said, you know, son, as a, as a business owner, you know, you need to know that, uh, winter's coming. That, uh, it, winter is coming again. Every eight to 12 years, it's coming. This time it's not going to bother you. Next eight to 12 years down the road, when, when that economy sinks and does whatever it's going to do, you need to have something salted away, you know, and, and that's, uh, boy, I tell you what, it, 
I got real lucky, Dan. You know, I say and I say eight to twelve years because I graduated high school in eighty four. In eighty seven, uh I, I just know it because I've heard about it. I, I, I it didn't affect me. I was too young. You know, nineteen eighty seven, uh which was a major uh, recession, stock market crash, and then uh I do remember two thousand when the tech bubble popped in two thousand eight when when the mortgage thing imploded. Uh, and, and that was really uh, around the time it, it it was only tough because I made it tough because that's when we pushed in our chips and went all in on GetDucks.com. Right. Now now here we are, 12 years later, longest and biggest bull market uh, coming to an end in American history uh, in, in 2020. Well, I know I know that in 2000, um, 2028 to 2030-something, there's going to be another one. It's just a cycle, you know. So uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think they ought to teach Dave Ramsey in the school system. For sure. <laughs> no doubt about it. And, you know, I guess, you know, before we started recording, I told you it was about November that I walked away from my job in the oil and gas industry. And, you know, so I'm going over my finances and looking at interest rates and, you know, uh, looking at, you know, refinancing the house and just, you know, moving stuff around. And I'm like, man, there's what 24, 26 million people in the last week and a half that filed for unemployment. Like, if they weren't set up or didn't think about this, and I know, you know, we weren't taught that in school. You weren't taught any of that. Maybe a, a checkbook balancing, but not how to manage money. So, I want my kids to make sure that they have a, a good understanding of that. And that's something that I'd say that my parents really never talked about growing up either. So, um, I guess I'm fortunate to be where I'm at currently, and and uh, hopefully my kids learning at six and four years old how to count money, <laughs> and uh, you know not not spend every penny they got might might help them in the long run. Yeah, it's very important, you know, and it, and, and it's not just I guess it's just uh, if you've got a plan, be it a financial plan or just a plan for life, a plan for career, plan you know, it, plans are subject to change. Mm-hmm. Budgets are subject to change, but it's just having that having that plan and having that direction to go into is a good life lesson in anything. Yeah, you yeah, know, have direction, not just get don't get caught in the rat race, right? Don't wake right. up, go to a job, come home, and not think about bills and you know figure all that out. So, Dan, tell me this: uh, just who who is who is Dan Ruska? Beyond HP Outdoors, that'll come later. But but who, where where are you from? What do you what do you do? How many years have you hunted? What who are you? Oh man, that's a fun question. Let's see. Um, so I live in Northwest Pennsylvania, about forty five minutes south of Lake Erie, um, about seven miles from the Ohio border. So my parents grew up in Pittsburgh. When my dad turned eighteen, he moved to California. And uh, my mom followed him when she graduated. So high school sweethearts, they're no longer together now, but um, part of the story, I guess. And uh, I was born in Whittier, California, which is right outside Los Angeles. And when I was about three years old, we moved back. And my dad was my dad was a, a duck and a goose hunter when I was little. And I remember, you know, he had a he had a ten gauge. And a, and a 12 gauge semi auto. And I remember the, the 12 gauge putting that up to my shoulder when, you know, those videos that you see online when it's way too big for you and just absolutely smashes your shoulder. That was my introduction to a shotgun. And I, <laughs> oh, just shoot up into the leaves, right? Well, yeah. And I remember him bringing birds home when I was little. And, and as we grew up, you know, we always hit the deer woods and, and uh, he didn't turkey hunt, but I remember him bringing that, you know, the ducks and geese home, and and I can't get him to go out with me now. And I'm like, what? You know, let's go, let's go somewhere. And oh, maybe. But uh, so many times in deer stand, I'd be freezing, and he'd let us walk back to the truck and turn it on and and heat up, and then get back, and we'd do all day sits with him. You know, from the minute we were, I'd say six or seven years old, we were up in the stand with him. So, you know. Uh, did a lot of trout fishing growing up around here, and um, I actually live in the house that my great grandmother bought in the '60s. It was her summer home. Wow! Uh, she lived in Pittsburgh, and she was from Czechoslovakia. And you want to talk about a tough woman there? 
and uh-huh. uh, sandblasting company and you know just talking about not wasting a single thing on your plate or anything man i i love that woman but uh you know going through high school uh played three sports and and always had time for deer hunting and you know my my freshman year of high school a couple guys invited me on a goose hunt out of my buddy, out of my buddy's farm and and they left about three rows of standing corn and it was snowing so hard we could barely see anything. So we had white sheets on us sitting on buckets and these geese were coming in like, I, I, we might've had four or five decoys out and these geese come in and we're just, it was a mess, man. Did we, we just crush them at, at 10, 15 yards maybe. And, uh, from there it was just kind of, I dabbled in it, you know, through, through the rest of high school, did a lot of small game hunting and, then through college, after my brother graduated, that would have been 2004 from college, um, he really got into waterfowl hunting. And his brother-in-law at the time um, did a lot of hunting, had a lot of permission around the area. So, you know, Christmas breaks, we would just hammer birds. And, and in college, I played baseball. So the whole entire fall, um, I went to Davis and Elkins College in Elkins, West Virginia. So I did a lot of hunting there, a lot of deer hunting. and not too much waterfowl. I didn't have a, a firearm on campus. So just a little bow and arrow and I stick deer every year. It was a good time, you know, cook over the fire outside the, but, um, what position that, did you play? What position did you play? Uh, my freshman sophomore year, I was center field and then I moved to right field. So, um, just gunning people out. It was a good time. Some of the best times of my life down there, but, <laughs> um, no, it was, uh, it was real fun. And then, uh, I was in front of a, a Padre scout. It was me and, um, one other guy who ended up playing for the Yankees and I blew my arm out in the fall before my senior season, but I actually yeah. got back and I, yeah, I was all region my senior year that I played. So six months to a year recovery and I was thrown in three months. So it was a, a weird, uh, rotator cuff injury and slap lesion and all kinds of fun surgery. But, uh, Back at it, really enjoyed it. Anyway, moving forward on to important stuff. Got home and really got <laughs> really got into to waterfowl hunting. So that was probably 2006, 2007 is really when I uh, started getting into it. And then, um, and did your dad hunt then? Not waterfowl. Dad, he, no, okay. So uh, white tail and and every so often we go out to Colorado or Montana elk hunting, but but that's about it. So, but yeah, I, I enjoy, you know, killing turkeys in the spring and we don't open up till beginning of May, which is so late compared to everywhere else, but our population is booming. So we really can't argue anything. And, uh, I'm going to shoot whitetails almost every year. And, uh, and I love duck them. I do something. Is that your favorite waterfowl? Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the turkey <clears throat> forest is a turkey hunter. Don't know where he got it from. <clears throat> I'm not a turkey hunter, and I'm just I'm just not. I, I just I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. And some buddies of mine said, "Oh, you just hadn't hunted the right turkey yet." I'm like, "Man, tur- turkeys just don't do it for me." I, I, I've tried. <laughs> I've killed I've killed ten turkeys, uh, and I've, I've I've killed some good ones. Uh, and I, I, I need to kill a Miriam, which everybody says is a pretty easy one. Jake, Jake and I talked about getting together in Nebraska this year to scratch them off the list. And, and I'll have the world slam, but it's just not, I don't know why it's not important to me. Yeah. I love to hear, I love to hear Forrest talk about it. Man, he, he's, I don't know if he gets in their head or they get in his head, but he is die hard on these turkeys, you know. Well, and, Nebraska uh, is shut down the, uh, out of state hunters. They, they are right now, but there, there's a chance, uh, because this COVID may not be what it was supposed to be and the time I'd open back up, there's a real good chance, uh, come May, they're gonna, they're gonna crack open. I heard, uh, Jake was telling me that the other night. There's a, you know, they've got a lot of, uh, out there at Prairie Rock. They do right. some turkey hunts and there's a good chance they're gonna be a salvage or May season. Um, so stay tuned. It looks like, looks like, looks like it's gonna happen. Yeah. You know, your son was talking about their, their five state tour that they go on and I had, uh, I had a buddy come over and borrow my Yeti because they they built a, a sleeping bunk in the back of uh, back of his truck and they were going on a ten day hunt through Kansas and Nebraska and then Nebraska got shut down so I think they're just hunting local and West Virginia maybe Ohio and 
you know, doing a, a, a short tour around here, but uh, I know he was really bummed about that. I, I had a great outfit and associate down in New Zealand where Miriam's had been stocked and they were at times thick as thick as could be. I know one time we were out on a farm somewhere over on North Island and it was like a big scraped up area, just like a big dirt area, you know? And I said, I wonder what they've been doing there. And he said, oh, they, they had a big turkey kill off. And I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, they killed 400 something turkeys and mm-hmm. dug a hole and buried them. Jeez. And, uh, cause they were agricultural depredations. You know, and uh, I'm like, Dad, Gums, we got to thinking about it. He said, are you a turkey hunter? I go, no, nah, not not like people think of turkey hunting. But <laughs> but Adrian and I actually talked about her. You know, I, I talked to you, listen, but I said, you know what I'd like to do would be to come over and do like a driven turkey hunt. If y'all got that many turkeys, put me on the edge of a tree <laughs> line and, and then just come over pa- and me pass you them. There you High go. volume pass shooting turkey. Now that would be my idea of a turkey hunt, <laughs> and uh, I don't know how it'd go over on the internet, but but that would be fun. I think. Yeah, I, I could I could get into that. No, Dan, no, and and talking about how you know turkey hunt doesn't do it for you. Every time I shoot a duck or a goose, there's a you know that just a, a push of adrenaline, right? And it's kind of the same when you when you shoot a turkey or a deer, but you're just in a blind and you get to laugh with people and, and you get to do it more than once and you don't have the entire season of prep and then it's all, you know, built up for, for one animal. So I, you know, I just, I got, I don't know. I don't want to say a quantity over quality thing, but, you know, just being out and, and enjoying a 60 day season is a lot more fun. Than um, I, I, it, it, I love the social aspect. I love the, the atmosphere, the duck camp atmosphere. And I've been in some I've been in some fun deer camps and everything else. You get that atmosphere around the dinner table, no matter what you're hunting. But but that that something about that camaraderie that uh, that buzz uh, going on in a duck blind or or, or or down at the skinning rack after the duck hunt, with all the blinds come in and everybody's just cutting up and talking. I just I love it. And anymore, I don't know if I'm getting older or I like it all. I like to pass shoot. I like to I like to decoy. I like to hunt geese. I like to hunt ducks. I like to spot and stalk you know I, I get the whole thing but but um I, I i like i like the um and i think it's stages and phases right you know i, I think we all start off in one thing we, we we step and we step and we step i don't think there's just four steps i think it's just like a gradient of a dozen steps or more but, but i i do like to go out like uh in azerbaijan and in, in this one particular place down in argentina Part of the appeal is is being in a blind by myself. You're, you're only hunting for two to four hours, mm-hmm. but 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 you're by yourself, and 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 in that element, I, I'm absolutely at at a state of hyper focus uh, that for a person that's ADD, I don't find anywhere else. I'm hyper, absolute hyper focus, and then when the truck pulls up to camp. Waiters come off, and, it's, and now now I'm in that social mode. Yeah. But, but but it's it's just something about it. And, and I'm I'm the, I'm really and truly uh, I'll offshoot every duck that comes in if I can. But but no, it's it's a uh, you know what I'm saying I mean I'm, I'm gonna shoot my six ducks if I get a chance in Mississippi. I'm gonna shoot my my whatever twenty ducks down in Mexico. What I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna play play to play to uh to the stopping point. But but I can be happy anymore. I can be happy by myself. I can be happy shooting two or three ducks if I know that I played a clean game, uh, and I, that that would you know, and if I play a clean game and maybe you only come in with three ducks, but you only had a chance to kill three. Right. He said, "I'm sorry, that that that, that I, I find a sense of accomplishment in that." You know. Yeah, I'm definitely in the uh, in the game of chess, and you know the whole entire setup and. And making things work the way I want them to work instead of yes. you know the, the pile picks and stuff like that. So it's more of a I'm a I'm at that stage now. And now you know being able to take the kids and knowing that I only have a certain amount of time before they get too cold or or lose interest and you know maybe make it some action happen. And and it is tough here in PA. You know it's just we don't have the volume that other places have. But it's uh. But you can still play. You still play a clean game. 
It, you know, you play play by those rules, which are kind of the duck rules, but it's your rules. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You, play, you know, I mean, I, I know guys that uh, will not shoot a duck unless it's paddles on the water. They, they, that's just that's their game, mm. and, and I get it. You know, but I play by a little bit different rules. But I'm just saying, <laughs> it, it, it's just uh, that's what I love about it. Man, duck hunting is so it's such a subjective experience. You know, you can put four guys in a blind together. Some of my best friends uh, that I've hunted with a long, long time. But and and what they get out of that duck hunt is a little bit different than what I get out of it. We, we're you know, isn't that, isn't that crazy? It's just it's a, it's a it's a very subjective experience. And um, and, and I, I guess I just I love the duck hunt. And I, I <laughs> Dan I, uh, HP Outdoors. Yes, sir. Love, love the podcast. How 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 long have y'all been doing this? Uh, and and how how and why did y'all get started doing HP Outdoors? Sure. Um, so Josh Palm, who's my business partner in, in there, um, we actually went to rival high schools here in Pennsylvania, and uh, you know, football and basketball and baseball, we played against each other, and uh, we'd get together, and I don't think we. We never hunted together through high school, but we would play on a a uh, Legion baseball team where the three local schools that were the biggest rivals around would play together during the summertime. So um, myself and Josh and our buddy Trav, you know, became real close friends there, and and now we hunt together quite a bit. Uh, when at least when Trav comes home, he works over in London, but. Uh, when I started getting hot and heavy into waterfowl, he's like, man, I need to try that. You know? So he ended up, he booked a hunt on um, Chesapeake Bay. And I think the first bird that came in was just a, a wood duck just came flying in and wow. And he shot it and was just like, yep, <laughs> this is my jam. Right. So, <laughs> so I know for, I don't know how long he's like, all right, man, just lay it on me. What do I need? What, you know, just, tell me everything because you know i'm trying to do this on myself and and uh i just can't figure it out or you know it's, it's taking way too long so you know a couple of years go by and we hunt together a few times and, and uh it was it almost seems like it was we started so we started the company in 2011 and we started by making wow. duck and goose calls and uh it seemed like it was the same time i don't know if we were influenced by duck dynasty to try and get that going but when they really started blowing up, I guess, on social media and, and TV and all that, you know, and they've been around for a long time, but um, it seemed like everyone was in the same boat doing it, right? And it got to the point where with my job and then, the, you know, kids here and, and Josh had a boy and, you know, trying to stay up till 3, 4 a.m. polishing calls. And uh, it just, it was wearing on me. I was like, man, it's not worth it. I can't stay up. And he's like, well, let's start a podcast. And I was like, I have never listened to a podcast. I don't know. What, what the heck is a podcast? Yeah, That's right. what somebody so, said podcast to me a few years. I'm like, what the heck is a podcast? Yeah. <laughs> so that was 2014. And, uh, and he's like, well, he goes, when I work out, I don't listen to music anymore. I listen to podcasts and I try and learn something new during that hour that I'm working out. Right. And I said, well, that makes sense. And I was like, well, you know, what do you want to talk about? And he's like, well, let's, you know, let's be mentors and people don't have to go through what I went through. I didn't grow up around it. I didn't, you know, my dad didn't teach me how to duck hunt or goose hunt. And, and, uh, I guess that's kind of our, our whole goal through the whole thing is bridging the gap between, uh, new and veteran hunters. So you don't have to go through the five to six year awful learning curve of never shooting a duck in some areas and getting out there and, and having a better shot. And, yeah, you know, so that was 2014 and, um, and we're still going. So that's about where we're at. That That's a good, that's a very, very good descriptor of HP outdoors. The way that y'all present it is mentors. I, 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 I would not have chosen that word to articulate, but that, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a great word. Yeah. It, 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 along those lines, uh, if y'all are mentors, how would you describe 
your audience, your listening audience. But but moreover, what, what I see in HP Outdoors is beyond uh, your listening audience. You, y'all have cultivated a uh, a really nice online community. Yeah, and it's kind of crazy. You know, when we started, yeah, I guess it, being around waterfowlers and going to shows and and seeing things that you didn't like and we knew what we didn't want it to be right we didn't want it we didn't want people coming up and asking questions and getting shot down or being told that they're you know dumb for asking that question amen right amen amen so um i guess i've kind of taken on the role of you know they (laughs) call me band hammer dan in the group just because you know we don't we don't let people swear. We don't let people, you know, just make fun of each other. And, you know, it gets wild in the off season a little bit and you gotta, you gotta, you know, play referee a little bit. But as far as just, if you're going to be rude, you're not going to be in there. And it's a place to learn. You know, we have a, a roll call by state. So new people join and they can find their state. And, and I don't know how many friendships we see being made and, you know, people saying HP happy hours. So these guys get together in the off season and girls, a lot of girls in there too. And, you know, they have a beer and then make plans for the fall and the winter time and, and they're getting out and, you know, crushing birds together. And, and it's just really, it's refreshing on our part. It's, it's a lot of work, but, um, I think you it, know, it takes been, a lot of work. Did it take a lot of work to, uh, Look, I've been to those chat rooms or those groups on social media that that are just a free for all Wild West Dodge City. What, does it take a lot of work on y'all's part to police it and keep the, the ambiance, so to speak? I think you know we've just been vocal about it from the start, and you know this is this is our group. Um, you know we have we have partners in the show, and we're not going to be a ragtag bunch that represents these companies, right? So um, that, and I don't, it's not too bad. Every once in a while, I mean, it's been a long time since I've said anything, like tone it down, but, you know, it gets to the point where I'll just delete stuff if, if it's not, uh, if it doesn't fit our standards and and people get mad and if they need to exit, then they can exit, but it, it really is uh, different than a lot of groups out there. I tell people the internet's a big place. Find find your place on it. But, but if you want to come stir stir the pot, stir the trouble, because I'm gonna bury my soul and tell you something. I killed my first duck when I was 18 or 19 years old, and I shot a pair of them. I, I had been deer hunting. I like to deer hunt. I, you know, that was my thing. I like deer hunt. I grew up wing shooting with my granddad and, and my folks. But uh, by the time right after high school, I, I was just a deer hunter and. uh not a very good one and not a very legal one all the time, but, but I got out there deer hunting and one night before dark, I shot a deer. He'd run off into a little patch out in the middle of a pasture about 150 yards away. And I was just letting it get dark, letting it cool off before I walked out there and, you know, and, um, and got him and all these ducks started flying in and I was up in a tree and they were flying at eyeball level coming in the roof and the swamp behind me. And uh, I went out there that evening, got got the little old deer and loaded him up and got him got him back to camp, skinned out and everything else. I got to think the next day. That was a lot of work for an individual, load up the big old deer and, and, and mm-hmm. skin him and go, you know, I, I, I didn't want a deer hunt the next afternoon. I said, I'm going to go back and sit there for dark and didn't know much about duck hunting. Didn't have a call, didn't have waders. Just went and sat on a, a little hump out in the swamp and it was pitch black dark way past legal shoot time, I later learned. Uh, when, when, when right there in front of me, this duck or two, and when I pull the trigger up and boom, shot, a pair of mallards fell, one shot, two mallards. And I was hooked. You know, I, I, I thought I was, not I wasn't a duck hunter, duck hunter. I knew what a mallard was. And, and, and so throughout, uh, the next couple of years, I'd go shoot some ducks or hunt rabbits or hunt deer or just do whatever. I wasn't a duck hunter per se. I was just a hunter and duck a part of it. And I went down to a big, big Texas ranch. Again, whitetail deer. I wanted to be a deer biologist. That's why I went to college. And I got a great job to go down to, uh, near the border of Texas. And uh, I'm still in touch with that biologist that hired me. And it was 107 square miles, and there were stock tanks. Every time the wind blew out of the north and the fall, ducks came in. We got up there around November, December, and uh, duck season was open. And uh, I went out, and no decoys, no call, no no know-how, but I knew how to shoot. So I would just sit quietly. And if a duck would 
fly by within killing range, I'd shoot him. And, uh, and then the duck would rally for a little bit. And I'd shoot a few more and go on back to the house. First duck I shot, I was not, down there in Texas. I had to been 21. I had to go look it up in a bird book. It was a, it was a hen, it was a hen gad wall. I'd never seen a hen gad wall before. There you go. It was a hen gad wall. It break, break all these years later. I, I know what that duck is now. I've, I've come a long way to say, but, uh, I, I, I've just something about the internet. I know that when somebody holds up a hen gad wall or a duck and ask a group of duck hunters what kind of duck this is, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's like, you know, but see, I'm human enough. I can relate back to three decades ago being that young man that, that my daddy quit duck hunting. I never duck hunted with my dad, you know, when I got into this thing. And and somebody's got to teach people how to hunt. So, and so, man, I tell you what, the word mentor, that, that's, a, that's a real needed place right now because not only are a lot of people, a lot of dads not hunting anymore, not duck hunting anymore to take their kids hunting, uh, you know, it, it, it could be, this, this, this kid could, could be a, uh, be raised by a single parent. And, and, you know, the fact that he doesn't know what a hen gadwall or this particular duck he lucked into killing he is right now is, is, is no reason to throw him out of the, throw him out of the fraternity, right? Well, so, uh, you know, I mean, one of the worst things to see, you know, I, I worked with a couple guy or used to work with a couple guys that you try and get them out hunting their friends that they might have tried it one time and that ah, really wasn't for me. Well, come on out and let's, you know, let me show you how we do it and maybe you'll like it, right? Yeah. So then, right. If these people are, are say they're, you know, my friends like that, but they're somewhere across a different states, and they go out and try and say, hey, I finally went on my first solo hunt, and, you know, and I've seen this on groups all the time, and, that you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure what this is, and then, you know, uh, just a barrage of why are you pulling the trigger and blah, 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 and, and then before you know it, their their name is grayed out, so, you know, they're, they quit that group. They're gone, and just that one experience when we're trying to recruit hunters, yes, is awful, right? Yes, you know people, people like me and you, and you know our friends that try and get people out and try and grow the sport, and then it all it takes is one, you know, you it takes one person to make a comment, and and they're done. So there's that one person, and if he ever talks to anyone else, well, you know, it was an awful experience. I can remember when, you know, by, by, by comparison, my own children, you know, they, they cut their teeth on duck calls when they were literally infants, you know, changing diapers, that kind of stuff. You know, they knew, as far as I can remember, uh, when he was four or five years old, he wanted his first duck to be a Eurasian widget. That's what he wanted for his first duck, a Eurasian widget, you know. It was a, uh, no, it was a blue winged teal. He still ain't killed a Eurasian widget, but, but still, they, they knew. You know, somebody's got to yep. teach somebody, and you're you hit the nail on the head. We need hunters, yep. you know, and 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 they're 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 gonna be that young bunch out there next to you in a duck blind, not playing by your rules unless somebody mentors them on what the rules are. Yeah, well, and I, I totally relate to that. My four year old. He wants to kill all these wood ducks passing back through now, you know, coming back, <laughs> coming back home to get these boxes. And so my boy loves wood ducks. Uh, my oldest girl, oldest by 45 seconds. Uh, she, she loves green heads. She's a mallard girl. And then Sadie, she, she wants the, her first one to be a pintail. So, uh, it's funny because we're driving, we drive around all the time and, and I say, let's go drive the block and see what animals are out, which there's a ton of deer around here, turkey, you know, and we'll get into, you know, some geese and ducks. And there's this one cornfield that they dam, not on purpose, but they ended up damming up a, a low corner of it. And you drive by and this spring is just packed. And I'm looking, I was like, what is that bird? And there's a, a pintail mallard cross. And I was like, well, two of you are going to be happy. I don't see any wood ducks, but there's a pintail and a mallard combined and man did it blow their mind how does that happen <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so, but uh my my middle child uh sadie just in the last couple of days they 
they've always wanted these little cameras. I, I take pictures every once in a while, and um, they get one of these little cameras. And just the other day, actually yesterday, I let her take one of my nice cameras out, and she's taking pictures that are blowing my mind. And I I posted them online and told people to guess who who took it, me or my six year old, <laughs> and to have people messing up who took the picture kind of makes me question myself, but I'm also very excited to have her in the field and out. And so tonight again, I put the 70 to 200 on and she's taking pictures. Of, I saw the first goslings around here tonight. Uh, so she's taking pictures of those. And um, she has some real nice shots of banded geese. And man, I'll, I'll send some to you that, that I'll pull off the card here in a little bit, but you know, it, as bad as all this COVID is, and like you said, running the rat race and just needing a, a downturn to reevaluate stuff, I've really, I want to say I've really enjoyed all the time I've spent with my kids. Like it's a, it's a big eye opener and, and seeing them come alive of not just being through, I don't want to say anything bad about public schools, but, you know, really being the way life should be probably with your parents. Yeah. So, um, I know Josh yeah. and I talk about that all the time. He just, his little girl's just over a year old. And, uh, you know, he's like, man, this sucks. You know, I don't see my kids in the morning and I get home, we eat dinner and I put them to bed. And, you know, he's like, that, that's not how it should be. So, you know, we, we talk about it often before any of this hit. And, and uh, you know, it's nice to see them enjoying and, and wanting to learn kind of what dad does and, what what I enjoy, so I think I have a couple of hunting partners here in the future, really. That's good, you, you, you know, because you're gonna blink and they're gonna be gone, and it's like as much time as I feel like I spent with my children hunting and fishing and, and doing that kind of stuff, it wasn't enough. I feel I, I feel like I, it should have been more, but I was busy, you know. I, I was in that rat race. I, I was I was running in that escalator, and 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 it's just now. I mean, I I look back the last. I couldn't say this two months ago, but I can say it, you know, about four weeks ago, I realized, you know, I burned out, man. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, uh, I'm I'm ready. I'm as ready as anybody for, for my neighbors and myself and everybody else to get back busy and, and doing what we do and, and making money. And, you know, but I sure am enjoying this, this pause right now, mm-hmm. you know, just, just, to, just to rest and spend time with my kids. Uh, but Duncan, my oldest, uh, my, my middle son is, uh, is in Okinawa. We FaceTime and we talk to him as much as we can, you no know, over the internet. My other two kids are home right now. And that's that's nice. I'm enjoying that. Uh I've I've seen seen more of them in the last month and a half than in the last five years. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the the one bad part about it is that, you know, my wife being at the hospital and my dad lives we have um like ninety five acres here and he lives kinda on the other corner. Uh, of of the property, if you want to call it that. So my kids walk through a little path, and and they're right right in his backyard. And you know, with the wife not knowing if she has it for the incubation period of four to fourteen days or whatever it is, you know, we're trying to keep our distance, and, and that kind of stinks to try and keep the kids away from them. So they'll come over. And, oh, you know, we'll be out in the yard. But you know, he's about a a year out of some. Uh, bone marrow cancer so as far as oh. you know, being being uh vulnerable to anything like that i'm like <laughs> we can't do it so they'll they'll stop by and you know he'll, he'll still give them candy and all that but i'm like no hugs and you know just don't cough on them and but uh you know he's doing pretty good so damn what what uh do y'all have any long-term goals with HP Outdoors? Now that y'all been doing this a long time, and and have you have you developed any further goals of what y'all hope to accomplish or down the road? You with know, your message, uh, with your narrative—that's what I'm gonna call it. With your narrative of HP Outdoors. Listen, we have we have a couple ideas, and uh, just recently we started doing what we do now on our show is we do. Uh, live interviews and we got some programming that we're able to have uh, the people listening ask questions. So when we're in the middle of an interview, you know, they can throw out a question and, and our guests can answer it right then and there. And then it's just a, a lot more interactive. So instead of us getting hammered with questions after a, after a show and then, then trying to get someone on and, 
and answer that, you know, a month or three or four months down the road, um, people seem to really be enjoying that. So uh, pretty cool. I I'm not, I can't divulge too much of what we're working on, but uh, we have a few things that we're going to try and put out, and I think people might like it. Good. you you got to constantly evolve. Here, here's something. Uh, one of the last times I heard from you, I listen to your podcast all the time, but one of the last times I heard from you, I got a text from me out of the blue, and you were going through custom tail, just like I had been recently, <laughs> going through Toronto. Was that your first time through Toronto? Uh, that was my first time hunting Canada. Yeah, so taking mm-hmm. a firearm across the border. Um Boy, you picked a doozy to go through for the first time. Yeah. Well, first of all, I didn't understand how big Toronto Airport is. It, it, from where we landed to where we had to take off and going through all the doors and runways and, and everything else, I mean, it, it took us a good time. And I had a an older gent with me, too, and, you know, I was letting him keep up. But, I mean, just the, the massive size of that I wasn't quite used to. And then... You know, everything going up was fine. Um, the hunt was outstanding. In Were y'all hunting in Ontario? No, we hunted in Saskatchewan. Yeah, so, okay. Um, man, man, was that a blast. So our plan is to go back up in September, and hopefully the border and everything else is open. Um, but, yeah, coming back, you know, the – and I don't even know, you know, this, this guy <laughs> – I go up and I ask the girl, I was, we're almost through everything and I'm just waiting to do the final thing before I get to go to my gate. Right. And asked the lady, I was like, I'm, I said, I'm not trying to be pushy or anything. I said, we, we take off in about an hour. And I was like, I'm just for knowledge and, and knowing like how long does this usually take? And she's like, Oh, they're looking through your stuff right now. And, and once they're done, you'll be able to go. And I think the guy that was looking through my stuff heard me ask that, and it just must have been a, a bad day for him. And mm-hmm. he came and sat in a chair right next to her, talked to her and the guy next to him for about 45 minutes. And my gun is sitting right behind him. And I'm like, so I'm sitting there, and I mean, it was it was just pure BS, if you want to call it. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like... um I went back up and I was like, we're leaving and, you know, our flight's taking off a little bit. Is there something else that I need to do? And they're like, no, just, you'll come up when you're called. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no. Oh. I said, all right. So here we are. And, and the guy with me, he's, I'm a very calm and like just happy go lucky person most of the time. So my buddy's like, he's like, Dan, just sit down and, and, uh, let's see what goes from here. And he's like, well, where's your paperwork at? And I was like, uh, you know, I handed everything in. I was like, you show up to an international border without the correct paperwork. I should confiscate your gun and uh, and make you pay tax. Uh, you know, I don't know if you bought it here or not. And I was like, you have everything that, you know, I came with from Cleveland showing that I brought the gun into the country and just going off. Well, you need to go to an international airport and get essentially a, a passport for your firearm before you come up here again. So. At this point, we have about five minutes before our plane takes off. And uh, I was like, "Can I said, I'm not trying to be rude, but I said, what other paperwork do we need? Can he? 4457. So he pulled, he pulled out a piece of paper. He's like, you need to fill this out. And it was just name and, you know, what, what kind of firearm you had. And I was like, oh, can I fill it out now? He's like, no, you're good to go. So mm-hmm. that was after... You know, how long of waiting? So we walk out, and I asked the lady at one of the desks, I was like, can you check on this flight? She's like, yeah, it's just left. I said, great. Yep. So, so then the rest of the the rest of the trip home was a debacle because they're like, we can get you into we, – we flew out of Cleveland. And she said, the, the next flight into Cleveland is totally booked. You can be on the reserve list, or we can book you for Pittsburgh. But if, if seats come available to Cleveland – then we won't be able to get your stuff from the Pittsburgh plane onto the Cleveland plane. And I said, well, I'm not going to stay the night here. I said, I've had enough of this place. So I said, book us for Pittsburgh. And so the Pittsburgh and the Cleveland flights were in gates right next to each other. Well, 48 of 50 seats got on the Cleveland flight. <laughs> so, wow. And it was me and my buddy. We could have 
you know, been to Cleveland, had no issue. Um, so I called my dad and I was like, Hey, can you make a hour and 45 minute drive to Pittsburgh and pick us up? And we'll get over to Cleveland at a later date to get our truck. So we get to Pittsburgh and none of our stuff was in Pittsburgh. So yeah, wow. Uh, it was, <laughs> so yeah, it was a, it was, so this, uh, this was coming home. This was coming home. Yeah. So yeah. So that that's the cluster. I, I have I have been through lots and lots and lots and lots of airports, and I will never, folks, anybody listening, never go through Toronto Airport with firearms coming home. Don't do yeah. it. Avoid because they've got it, it's a cluster. It is a cluster. And you know, I'm I'm not a uh, I'm not a mellow yellow guy. My personality is not just. But but I have developed over time this this airport zen I call it I'm just <laughs> zen so so I'm calm and I'm focused and I got my paperwork you know and and we go through we go through the uh, you know it it's it, you're in Canada Toronto Canada but they have a U S customs and they got U S right. agents there that I guess are getting paid. Uh, some kind of fifteen thousand a year. The way uh, it's uh, way way more than that. I guarantee you they're, they're probably everyone's probably making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year. Plus, they're probably getting some kind of a big allowance to be over there on these details. And we went I through how angry he was. It couldn't have been that much. Well, by the time we went that. through the whole cluster of 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 that big long rat maze line, you know, we had plenty of time. I wasn't just like panicking. I was focused, but I wasn't panicking. Until the guy said, "Yeah, bring it around here," and he said, "Just have a seat," and uh, and I kept standing. He said, "Go have a seat," because he was taking out his sandwich and poured a cup of coffee. Mm. I'm like, "Well, uh, I really ain't got time to take a seat." You know. So then he he he, he folds the sandwich back up and begins to unload every single bit of my gun case and my my suitcase. Unload it, yeah. stack it up. I'm like, yeah, this and, and 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 uh, he he had to call a lady because he said, "Well, you got cartridges in your gun case. You can't do that in Canada." I said, "But you're American." He said, "Well, it's a Canadian rule." So he called a Canadian, and um, and she came and shrugged. And he said, "What about this?" She, she shrugged. She just literally shrugged. Yeah. And said, "This was unnecessary." And at that time, I got so quiet. I got so quiet. I think it scared him <laughs> because I was so quiet. Yeah, I believe. And it. and and, uh, and and he invited me to come back there. He couldn't get it loaded and get it shut. So he invited me to come back there. In which case our, our plane had been gone. It had been gone. We had we had an hour when we came in there to see him. It had been gone thirty minutes. Yeah. The next we had to get a night get to spend a night at the hotel. Come through the next morning in Toronto, and I was coming through, and I, and <laughs> I, try, I tried to cut through another line. I ducked up under the rope or something and did something, and, oh, gosh, it, it's like uh, five alarms went off and everything else for it just peeled on out, out of there behind me. He, he just took off like he didn't know me. Now, I had to deal with all the cops and all the customs, you know, yeah. and try to very dedicately explain, well, I, I, I'm sorry, sir, but I missed my flight yesterday. I don't want to miss it today. Yeah. And then we went. We went back there the next day. It was just easy as pie. The guy was like, "Oh man, yeah, no problem." It took five minutes. Hmm. I bet y'all well, got I mean, the guy I had. We were close to uh, to renting the car and just driving. I mean, we'd been home in what four, maybe four hours. About I, will, like, I was. I was so mad at this point. But oh, I forgot to tell you this part. So we got, you know, I think it's what a pink, a pink slip and uh, a yellow slip maybe two yellow slips. Um, when we boarded our initial plane, they, I only had one yellow slip and they took it. So when I showed up to the gate to go to Pittsburgh after all this happened, they're like, where's your yellow slip at? And it, it's the one that says, I have a firearm. I have a, I have ammo. You check whatever box and then you sign it. Right. And I was like, well, they took that when I boarded. And they're like, well, you need another one. So this is as I'm one of the last people to get on the plane to Pittsburgh my parents grew up in Pittsburgh. I'm very, I know Pittsburghers and we're delaying the flight and it's late, right? <laughs> so I was like, well, don't you have another one here? I will sign, I'll fill it out and sign it. They're like, well, we have them here, but not at this terminal. And this, bless this girl's heart, this young girl, she's like, I'll go get you one. 
And I mean, they're calling over the radios and stuff. They're like, Oh, we don't have one here. You know, we don't have one here. And, uh, this lady, this girl runs out onto the tarmac and she cannot get back in from outside. So she had to run all the way around the airport. <laughs> wow. This so like 45 minutes later, she comes back, she's sweating. She's out of breath. She has a stack of these papers. And I was like, I don't think it's uh, appropriate for me to hug you right now, but I would really like to. And yeah. She, started, she just started laughing. By this time, they turned the plane off. The the pilot came inside to see what the holdup was. All right. <laughs> wow. So we're like, I was like, I'm just waiting for one little piece of paper to say I have a, a firearm and I don't have any ammo. She's like, all right. So we walk out and um, I was like, I'm sorry, but I said, Mike, they're like, your carry-on has to go onto the plane. I was like, I'm not getting on that plane until I see my carry-on go on there. I said, I have, uh, you know, $10,000, $12,000 worth of camera equipment. I took by. I am not getting on that plane. So they had to open up the plane, put our stuff on. <laughs> I saw it. So I saw it. We walk in with the pilot. We go and sit down. And uh, they're like, you know, you're in the emergency bro. That's fine. So she had to go through the entire spiel of being in an emergency row. So we sit there and we're sitting there about five minutes and just everyone is hating us right now. Like just delayed everything. Right. Yeah. She comes walking back smiling at me. I'm like, Oh, here we go. And she's like, the plane's not balanced. You guys have to move seats. <laughs> I was like, well, you just get me home. Right. So, so finally we took off and I was like, I can't handle this anymore. So, we got there and we get back to Pittsburgh. My dad's there. He's like, where's your stuff supposed to be showing up? And we went to the to the turnbuckle there and none of our stuff showed up. So then we had to fill out the paperwork and uh, my gun came from Pittsburgh two days later and all my gear came from Cleveland three days later. That's, you know, and, and, and by federal law, the firearm is supposed to travel with the passenger, with its owner. By federal law. And, and so, you know, we have to play by the rules, but they don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, for anybody listening, I'm, I'm certain that the form that U.S. Customs asked you for when you were coming back through is called a Form 4457. If you travel with firearms, I'm speaking to anybody listening that is planning on travel with a firearm. You go to your local customs office. It's near the airport, not in the airport. Bring your firearm. Make an appointment. Bring your firearm in a case. They freak out when you walk in with a gun. It's not in a case. And uh, you lay it out, and they fill out this form, and it's just you, you, your name, your address, make, model, serial number of the firearm. And they put a little rubber stamp, and it's good forever or until that expiration date set, but it's generally good forever. And, uh, and you know, if you read U.S. Customs on policies, they recommend filling out that form not only for firearms but for anything of value Right. That is right. that is newer than five years old. So, so that way, if you go into uh, come back from a foreign country, they don't know you're trying to skirt the taxation laws or something like that. But since nine eleven, it's mandatory. It, it, it it's mandatory. Now I've had clients forget it, not have it, you know, just come on through anyway, at the peril of missing their flight or complications or arguments or emotional breakdowns, which you subject to do when people are giving you a hard time over nothing. But but we, you know, everybody just, just I have got probably a forty four fifty seven for every single firearm I own that I travel with. And and, and, and and then it gets real wrinkly when you go to South Africa because they want you've got to have a forty four fifty seven or even Argentina if you bring your own firearm, you've got to have a US generated forty four fifty seven, but the expiration date and, you know, you, you, if you just go Google 4457 online, you can, you can print that form off and take it to customs with you. But it's got to have the right expiration date for you to enter into some of these other countries. So that, 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 that that's the free uh, educational spill for the day. But it, it's a, it's a major <laughs> show. Of the night. Yeah. I, I will not. I, we're going to Ontario uh, this year, and I have already decided I'm driving. I am not flying through. Toronto for the remainder of my life. I will not fly through Toronto. It is a cluster of effort for him. Yeah. Yeah. What other what other opportunity, no Dan, because uh that was your first time to Canada. What other what other opportunity have y'all developed with y'all y'all's uh 
y'all's HP Outdoors. I mean, you know, you you you've created, you've cultivated a, a beautiful community, a, a great listening audience, and, and it's created opportunities for y'all. Yeah, for sure. Um, you go to Canada. What else? Uh, Canada, um, Big Kansas Outdoors. You know, Ben is a big part Absolutely. of what we do. Um, uh, he's on U.S. Hunt List with you, right? Yes, sir. Great guy. Great, great operation. I, and I've been to I've been to both of them. I've been up, up to Canada and to Kansas, and it's just yep. a fun time. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Great, uh, he takes great pride in what he does, and uh, man, he puts you on birds, or he, he'll die trying. I know that. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, Oklahoma, been down to Arkansas, um, Maine, and just the the number of invites is incredible and not not just from uh outfitters but just people in the group hey if you want to come out here if you want to come to washington oregon utah montana wherever like just get out here you know and you know one of the one of the best times was going up um with some listeners up to maine and uh ryan lilly with old town canoes and uh, a couple other gents up there you know they're come stay at my house and, and I'll, you know, I have bunk beds in my basement. It's finished. And, and, you know, so a group of us go up and it's negative 26 when we woke up. It was negative 13 when we got to the ocean and paddled canoes out to an outcrop. And, you know, we shot a couple of eiders and uh, <laughs> it was, it was during a, a, a bomb cyclone. So essentially a, a snow hurricane hit and we had a, a uh, green jeans watching us the entire time. They actually called him to make sure that we were safe. And you know, he's like, I, I got to tell you, fellas, you're pretty crazy for going out there. There aren't any emergency services, you know. And <laughs> he's like, so he's like, I have a throw rope, so you better be careful. <laughs> and uh, man, but you want to talk about a cold, cold time. And one thing I didn't realize about Maine, you know, we're up there and um, probably 20 foot high from the water and these birds are just buzzing us, you know, and there's golden eyes all over the place. And it was just incredible. And, uh, he's like, Hey, we gotta, we gotta get out of here in a little bit. And I was like, Oh, why? Like, this is beautiful. You know? And he's like, well, where we're sitting is going to be underwater in about an hour. I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and he's like, no, I was like, that's, that's a 20 foot tide. He's like, yeah, he goes, I guarantee you this will be underwater. And, you know, when you see some of the oceans start freezing behind you and turn into slush, you're like, yeah, it's probably a good time to go. So um, I think the wind chill is probably about negative 45, negative 50, and they're telling me, you better cover up your face or you're going to go home with a black nose. You know, I'm like, all right, well, I, I trust you. So we got out and snapped some pictures. And I tell you what, those guys from Maine, when they get out in a long sleeve shirt and come and shake your hand, it feels like a brick of ice. And you're mm-hmm. getting out in this and you can't tie up your, your boots, your waiter boots. I'm like, oh my, what are we doing? And we're going to canoe out into the ocean right now with negative 45 wind chill. This is crazy, you know, on, on frozen rock. But, uh, that was, that was an absolute blast. And you go back and, and the guy we stayed with, uh, Ryan Dubé is a, a chef by, by training. So he had lobster and, uh, all the lobster, uh, prime rib. Oh. I mean, it was, it was a blast. So the friendships we've made and, and, you know, just getting to talk to people like you, you know, friendships there and, and just industry folks and, and learning from people that have been doing it a lot longer and a lot more places and experiences. I mean, but, but, but duck hunting is such, duck hunters are such a big global fraternity. You know, and duck hunting, and, and, and it kind of brings us right back to what we were talking earlier. Dan is about is about uh you know if 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 you grew up you shot those Canada geese for that first time and you shot some ducks and geese growing up through through high school and college and but now it 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 now the world is so much bigger than your own backyard mm-hmm. now 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 you're out there in a 24 foot tidal surge hunting sea ducks or you're or you're in a different part of the world you're up there hunting hunting barley fields with Ben or hunting hunting those uh some hidden pothole he's got over in Kansas, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and it's just, it, it's cumulative. And it's like all these years since I shot that hen gadwall, it, I'm, I'm still learning. Yeah. I'm still wild. I, I still show up somewhere I've never been and learn something about the history, about the culture, about the food. It's like, it's like, it's just so varied, mm-hmm. you know? And I, I just, I'm addicted to it. Yeah. Well, I, love each, it. I mean, each time you meet someone, it's 
enriches your life, right? Like I was out in Falco with with some other industry folks and you have someone like Lee Chose who, mm. you know, I listened to your guys' episode which was a <laughs> lot of a lot of band talk and you know <laughs> a lot of music talk. But Lee is uh he's something he's something else and to sit there and just talk about life with him for an hour by yourself, man, I mean that's invaluable, you know, and just I don't know. It's uh it's it's really special and to think that you have that opportunity because you enjoy shooting ducks is is pretty wild. You know, I I grew up reading National Ge- Geographic magazine. One of my grandmothers sent me National Geography. I, I can't hardly read them anymore because they seem to be another liberal agenda, but but back in those days it just opened up this world. You know, just just they'd have maybe four or five stories and it'd be just all over the world, different cultures, different people, different parts of history. And and, and the best way I can describe what I do and what you yourself are starting to do by branching out and, and meet more people and traveling to new places is kind of like walking through the pages of natural geography with a shotgun waders. And, and I love it. You know, it's just, it's just big, beautiful world and, and ducks are everywhere. And, uh, it, it, you know, just by chasing ducks, I'm, I'm seeing the world and I love it. Yeah. Absolutely and love I, it. I'm, I'm sure when you go different places, like every time I go, every time I go out with a, with an outfit or somewhere, just a different state and hunt with someone, I, I have so many questions. Like, why, why are you doing that? Like, you know, we do this back home and, you know, what, what makes you do this or move that there? And, you know, just like you said, you're always learning and, and I don't know if I'm annoying with all the questions I ask and I, it's not to be disrespectful or try to imply that I know something that they don't know, but just asking, you know, why are you doing that? Or why, you know, why is that set up over there? I don't understand that. And, mm-hmm. and when you have, uh, you know, just different perspectives, it's like, all right, that's another, you know, another piece of the puzzle that I'm putting together. So. Nah, I tell you, if they, if they get offended, they're not hearing what you're asking because that's, that's just part of sharing it is a part of getting to know everybody. And, and I, I ask a lot of questions. I, I, uh, um, my phone, I, you know, those notes in the, in the phone app, I, I, I fill it up. When I travel to new countries and every year I go back, I just take notes. You know what I'm saying? I'll, I'll yeah. ask questions. I'll ask questions about history. I'll ask questions about the foreign name of that duck or just what they know about that duck. You know what I'm saying? Uh, they, don't be, they don't have to be a biologist. I'm thinking Azerbaijan. What, what did they know? about a red-crested poacher and a hunter, you know, or, or down in Argentina about a rosy, uh, rosy bill poacher or a, I mean, it just, it's part of putting it together. And, and I, I love to ask questions because I, I'm heck, I might write a story or I may, may my own edification. I just want to know this, you know, about these birds and about these people and about their history. And, and I was in Russia one time, uh, first time I was in Russia and there was a young man, I can't remember his name. I have to go look back in my notes. Um, they don't duck hunt like we do. They don't have a duck duck hunting culture like we do. And um, and and he was uh, very helpful, and and we kind of got along with hand gestures and all for a few days. I watched this guy. Look, we we shot we shot some mallards down in an ice rimmed creek. Mm. And I was wondering how in the heck are we gonna get those things? You know, so I wonder, I mean, I, I was soaking wet up to my belly button from from being in hip boots and, and belly button deep water, and that was fine, but. I wasn't going swimming for those things. And he showed up and shrugged and just stripped down butt naked, jumped in the water. Uh, and I'm talking ice cold water and, and grabbed those ducks and threw them on the other bank, jumped up and warmed himself up and tossed them across the creek to us and jumped in the water and swam back and put on his clothes. Three days later, um, it was raining and I was with a group of Europeans that were off shooting shorebirds. And, uh, and that was fun to watch them through the window. This little camp truck, they little, little bitty, bitty, bitty cabin on the back of the truck had a little bitty pot belly stove. I didn't care about shooting shorebirds. Heck, you know, what do I want to shoot a shorebird for? <laughs> and, um, but I, but I took out my phone and started showing this young Russian some pictures. My wife, my kids, my home, my dog. Uh, American ducks or whatever, you know, just, and, and I had found this to be, he knew I was asking questions. I've been kind of hinting around asking questions, but he pointed at one of those pictures and he spoke an English word. I, I, I've been with this guy for three days. I go, you speak English? And he said, some, a little. His wife taught English. 
Well, that was it. The, the ice broke. And the Maltons loaded back up. We were heading to heading back to the cabin. And a big sedan pulled up. Guy stepped out wearing a three-piece suit and, and a nice overcoat. And we the, the back door opened up. We piled out of the trailer. And, and my host, that young guy, was pointing everybody to this sedan to go back to camp. And it, it was my turn to... I stepped off the truck. He put his hand on my chest and said, do you want to go to camp or do you want to go to the river? I hadn't seen the river. I'm like, well, I want to go to the river. I, I've seen camp. <laughs> Man, we went by his house. He introduced me to his wife. Uh, her two college friends were in town. They all spoke English. Now we all four could have have a big conversation. They they were pulling stuff out of the refrigerator and out of the cabinets to mama's homemade jelly or to grandmama's favorite something or the pies and all this all this stuff. We ate. We went to the river and we came in about three o'clock in the morning because it doesn't get dark until very late up there. And uh, the the outfitter like was freaking out. He 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 didn't know where I was. The mall was like, "Holy cow, where have you been?" I'm like, "I just got to see real Russia." Mm-hmm. And I had seen real Russia, and it all started by asking questions, showing an interest in him and his culture, and showing him pictures of mine, and 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 it just it was a big icebreaker. And I have learned to do that. I, I'll share my life and, and get theirs, and that is such a big exchange. People, I mean, trust you me. No matter where you go in this world, people love that you take an interest in what they do and how they do it mm-hmm. and, and they, they, they open up and want to start sharing and and so now I think that's a great idea I mean because you got I feel I feel like I've got something to learn everywhere I hunt and and, it, and it's just it's, it's part of life experience right I think one of the biggest eye openers especially like talking with the industry people and you know just these names that you know you know these world champs and and world champ callers and, and all like these people are so nice. You know what I mean? Like I think you look at the news and everything doom and gloom and doom and gloom and just awful. But then, you know, just having some faith in humanity and, and getting out and enjoying stuff is such a, you know, it's almost worth canceling cable and not caring what's going on on the TV. Cause you can't judge anything by it. And like you said, I'm sure those people were, for great people to to spend the evening with. Yeah, oh, you know, and I'd, I'd almost I'd almost add that Dan social media, unpoliced, free for all social media because I was I was with a a group down an outfitter down in Texas running gun outfitters this year. Fourth, and I stopped by and we hunt with some folks and um we all got to talking. Uh, fourth, and I left and we're going back. And we got talking to the guy and he got talking about something on social media, some of these clients, blah blah blah. I'm like, you know, I duck hunt with so many people over the course of the year. I'm telling you, social media does something to people, to some people, not everybody, Dan, but to right. some people it does something because I don't meet those guys out in the real world. If I'm in a duck blind, I don't, I don't meet that guy. Right. They're, they're, they're just regular folks. Yep. We're thinking on social media and, and it's like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde sometimes. Yep. <laughs> you know, yep. I mean, really, you know, I, I, I it's weird. It is weird. Dan, you know, I, I listened to y'all's podcast, and that's what made me think. Uh, I listened to your podcast last week. You had a couple of guests. We're talking about COVID, the effects. And uh, we, we've been all over COVID and, and, and some of the positive and negative things going on in our own lives right now. But how do you how do you see? Um, you had asked them, and they man, they brought some real nice perspective. I really enjoyed that podcast. I would tell anybody to go listen to that episode. What did, uh, how do you see this now? What's going on right now? The uncertainty. But how do you see it? I know how we. I know how it could affect industry, manufacturers, mm-hmm. product people. But how do you see it affecting you, or your family, or your audience, or your group? How, how, what, do, what do you see going on? Um. Well, I mean, on a personal level, just you know, it's such an adjustment to go to a store and see everyone looking like bandits, or you, you know, you walk, you walk in and feel uncomfortable because you don't know if the girl behind the counter thinks you're going to hold the place up. Right. Like it's just, it's a very awkward and antisocial um, situation that, you know, you, they can't see a smile. They can't see anything but your eyes when you're all covered up. And it's just a, it's a real it's an awkward feeling. It's not what we're used to, you know, we're a social uh, country and, you know, smile and shake hands and, 
and all that going on. But, you know, I, I feel like as far as our online community, um, there's a lot of people that are at home and, and trying to navigate their way through this. But I think, you know, I think people are hopeful that either that it's not as bad as what they think it is or they're looking forward to, to hunting in the fall and everything will be good by then. So I think, you know, our, our engagement is up, I think, because people are, are yeah. home and they're able to be online. Um, but I think people are really looking forward to things getting back to normal and, and that normal might happen right when season opens up. You don't know, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. We've, we've never been here before, man. <laughs> no, never we've never we've situation. never been here before, but but you know we've never been here before, and I know it's tough for everybody, but you know we're duck hunters, and, and I think I think <laughs> one thing we duck hunters have in common is we, by nature, are eternal optimists. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, you, 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 you wake up in the morning and are, are, are getting ready to go to bed, going to plan to go hunt tomorrow, and you already know the weather forecast is not too good for duck hunting. Nobody sleeps in. We all get up and go duck hunting. Yeah. We we know we, that we've got to be that way. Tomorrow's going to come. I don't know when it's going to break free. I don't know when the world's going to be quote normal unquote again. I know I went to the grocery store uh, last Saturday for the first time and since the last week of February, and and it was different. I, I felt different. I I just felt I don't know. It it, it just uh, I couldn't wait to get out of that place. Yeah, you know, and I just went there to grab some steaks and and, and leave. I, I I you know, man, people were acting different. Yep. You know, and it made me uncomfortable. Yeah, well, that's, I think, you know, part of that show last week, Barton was saying he went to the post office and the guy got within six feet and the person behind the, the counter was yelling at him, get back, like he was, you know, yeah, highly contagious. And it's weird. And, you know, I, I think what my biggest concern for um, people is, you know, when you talk about 24 million people being out of work and signing up for unemployment, you know, the the people out of work is higher than that. And, you know, just getting back to normal and, and what, what businesses are going to look like, you know, when, once you go online with, with your business structure and, you know, people aren't flying and maybe, you know, companies are going to downsize and, you know, how long is it going to take for people to get back to work and get that money to be able to, you know, buy decoys or buy a gun or, you know, go on hunts or whatever it may be. So I don't know. Um, I think the financial situation could really be gruesome for, for a little bit. It could be, but, but this American, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. One thing, uh, I'm no financial whiz. I'm certainly no economist. I can, I can tell you, but I'm a business owner. And, and, and I'll say this, that, that, uh, since, since we've been full time, as this business on for about 12 years now, I don't, I don't rest easy. I'm, I'm a worrier. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's a lot of pressure, good times or bad. You're always, you're always worried, right? I mean, I think all business owners would say they are, you know, you're always scared the music's going to stop. But, but I look back since I graduated high school in 84, there was 1987. There, there was 2000, there was 2008. Now it's 2020, but the distinction is, the economy was cranked up. In fact, the economy, uh, the, the 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 stock market, the Dow Jones, is is way higher right now than it ever was pre right. Trump taking office. Yeah. Despite this COVID thing sticking a big stick in the spokes, and and so we don't know how long it's going to take back for everybody to get back on their feet, for everybody to feel normal, for everybody to have disposable income to go buy that new coat or that new shotgun or more shells or whatever. But we're hunters. You know, and, and I, I would, I would say, uh, take care of your family, take care of yourself, stay forward thinking, take advantage, take, take, take advantage of the blessing right now. Worry about tomorrow, tomorrow, right now. Take advantage and be thankful and spend time because you have time right now with the people yeah. that, that matter most in your life. And, and then, you know, worry, uh, Mark Twain used to say, worrying is paying taxes you don't yet owe. Worry later. Yeah. That, that, that's my, you know, because this, this has been a, this has been a, a kick in the crotch for us, um, and it will be. It, it's, it, but what we know, having been here, we know we're going to be able to work through it. It's just going to take working through it. Yeah. And uh, getducks.com's not going anywhere. We're, we're going to be here when, when the music starts playing again. Yeah. But, but until then, we're going to cinch up our belts and do what Americans do. We're going to plow ahead. 
you know, and, and, uh, and uh, to what you're saying, enjoying this time, you know, I'm, I read articles and I know it's not good for me mentally to always read that stuff, but you know, I'm reading it and my six year olds are reading now. So they look over my shoulder and I'm looking on my phone and does that say more deaths? And I'm like, I do not need to be reading this right now. Like I got three beautiful, healthy kids in front of me and I may, you know, why am I worrying about that? Like take care of your own and it'll work out. So the American it, it's, it's going to work out. Yeah. I I just, you know, having grown up, especially in the deep south with the hurricanes and the floods and the tornadoes, you know, if you want to see America at its best, show me a crisis. Mm-hmm. America's rise to the cause we always have. World War One, World War Two. I mean, hurricane blows in, big flood down in Houston. Here here comes the Cajun Navy. You know what I'm saying? We're going to be fine. It just, it's, it, everybody's going to have to just tighten up and enjoy the time. And, and, and work towards the future, and it's, it's going to be okay. You know, I really believe that. that. One thing that I've enjoyed about not seeing the media. Break it up a little bit. Go ahead. Oh, you got me now? Yep. I enjoy not seeing the the petty news articles of people getting upset about such small things. And yeah, that being that being a headliner, and yeah, I've kind of I've, I've told my friends and my wife this before. Like when I see stuff like that, I'm like, I wish that, like, I don't wish pain or anything to anyone, but I wish some of these people would be put in a situation where they had to reevaluate what matters. And yeah. I feel like this is a huge reset for our country because honestly, some of the stuff was getting out of hand. Yeah, <laughs> and it's it been right so. Does anybody really care what uh, some pick an actor from Hollywood thinks about anything? You haven't heard of it from any of them. And I hadn't missed it. Nope, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, right? You know, I hadn't missed it one bit. You know, uh, I, I love I love a lot of pro sports. I do love sports, and uh, I like to watch baseball. And uh, but no, I I, I don't I don't. And I watch movies, and I watch TV, and I watch Netflix, but I don't care what their politics are, yep. you know. And I don't miss it, you know. And uh, but anyway, that's a that's a very that's a very good point to end on, Dan. You made a very good point there. But what it, it's all about what matters most. Yes, sir. And uh, but anyway, Dan, thank you so much for coming on tonight, and guys. Thank y'all for listening. Uh, y'all can y- y'all can find Dan at uh, at HP Outdoors. On yes, Instagram. That'll be our Instagram and everything went to Facebook. If you want to join our, our Facebook group, um, HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast Listeners Group, and there's a couple, there's three questions pretty much ask, asking if you are mature enough to engage online. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, as, as we mentioned, we, we don't put up with stuff and it's, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to call it a safe space, but if you want to go and learn and ask questions and hear from people all over the country and world, then come on in and we'd love to have you. Amen. Thank you, Dan. Guys, Thanks for having thank me. Thank y'all for listening. At Ramsey Russell, get stuck. Thank y'all. See you next time. Duck Season Somewhere is produced by Ben Page. Original soundtrack by our friend Cody Huggins.